ready to rock today, Fire Nation. JLD here, and welcome to Entrepreneurs on Fire, brought to you by the HubSpot Podcast Network with great shows like ABM Conversations. Today, we'll share how three doctors are breaking the sales training mold. To drop these value bombs, I have brought Daniel Bay into EO Fire Studios. Dr. Dan, CEO of Close for Cairo, tackles the sensitive subject matter of sales head on. Alongside his two partners, they become the top sales training program in the chiropractic industry and beyond. And today, Fire Nation, we'll be chatting about how bad doctors are at sales. They're just terrible. We'll talk about the prospects BS meter. We'll talk about marketing versus sales and also STFU. You'll have to stick around for that one. And so much more when we get back from thanking our sponsors. The My First Million podcast features famous guests, discusses how companies made their first million, and brainstorms new business ideas based on the hottest trends and opportunities in the marketplace. One recent ep was all about how venture capitalists make money. Listen to My First Million wherever you get your podcasts. Dan, say what's up to Fire Nation and share something that you believe about becoming successful that most people disagree with. Hello, Fire Nation. This is Dan from Close for Cairo, shouting all you guys out. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, wow, what is something I believe in that about becoming successful that most people disagree with? This is an easy one, and that is embracing and learning the art, science, and philosophy of sales. Sales usually gets a bad rap, so when I usually lead with that, get a lot of eyebrows that raise. I get a people to tell me that my concept and my construct about sales is wrong. It's sleazy. And I believe that's probably the one thing that most people disagree with. In Fire Nation, we're going to spend pretty much the rest of the episode proving to you just how right Dan is. Because we're going to talk about how three doctors are breaking the sales training mold. So Dan, let's be honest with Fire Nation. Doctors aren't just bad at sales. They are terrible. What have you learned training the doctors to not be so terrible at sales? Well, first of all, most doctors are what we call accidental salesmen. And that's actually a title of a book that I read very early on in my career. They didn't start their careers ever contemplating that they were ever going to need to learn anything about sales or marketing or even business for that matter. So classically, you're right, John. Most doctors are horrible at business in general, and on top of that, they're even notoriously horrible at sales. And the reason why they're so bad at sales is because they all come to the table with this very antiquated and um, old-fashioned notion that sales is supposed to be sleazy. It's trying to convince someone that they should buy from you um, something that people don't want don't need, don't care about, and frankly, can't even afford. And their job is to convince them against their will for them to do something that they honestly, from their core, do not want to do. So that is problem number one, because if they can't accept that sales is a fundamental thing, kind of like marketing or creative writing or any subject in academia for that matter, if they can't even come to the table and accept that sales is a thing that needs to be studied, like any other art form, that stops the tape right there. They're never going to read about it, never going to learn about it. And for a matter of fact, they will never, ever listen to a guy like me about it. So Fire Nation, I hope you're really understanding this whole process. I mean, I look back at it and I'm just like, people didn't graduate dental school or chiropractic school or medical school and say, okay, now I'm going to go out and I'm going to find out how to get clients. I'm going to find out how to market myself. I'm going to find out how to get traffic to my store. They're like, no, like I'm an expert at A, B, or C, or one of those things. But man, if you really want to be a success in these industries, you're going to need some of these skills. And there's something called a prospects BS meter that I want to dive into, Dan. So what the heck is a prospects BS meter? Well, BS stands for what everyone should know what BS stands for. And a BS meter is this very uh, subjective um, meter that every human being uh, has. And that is a meter that tells the person innately, subconsciously, if something is BS or not. And I don't think I have to go into this, John. I think we all understand there are certain situations where we talk to people, whether in a 
in a sales environment or even in a, in a uh, dating environment or social environment, some people just kind of make you say, you know, I, I don't believe you. I don't trust you. And I don't really believe that speaking to you or having you serve me serves my best interests because you're trying to push your own agenda, which I don't agree with. So that BS meter now, especially in today's time, and I don't know if we're going to date this, but right now, everyone knows what's going on. If people are way more sensitive on this BS meter, they're questioning everything. And when a prospect has that very sensitive BS meter, you have to know what you're doing because you can inherently tick off people's BS meter uh, without even knowing it. And that happens to a lot of people who, what I say, who I say train or try to sell by looking like they don't want to sell. And that dichotomy and that contradiction right there uh, sets up, um, you know, the raised eyebrow and makes the prospect say, hey, you know, I, I, you know, so I, I can't put my finger on it, but you know, that guy is just, I don't think I really want to buy from him. I don't think I want to be his patient or be, be his customer or be his client. And there's so many different ways that um, salespeople and accidental salespeople, or especially doctors in my field, tip off the BS meter every single day. And they just can't understand how or why. They just know at the end of the conversation, their patient, their customer, their client says, you know what? I'm going to have to go talk to my fish about this. It's just not, I don't, I don't know. I need to go home and think about it. It's too much money, too much time. And I think uh, for entrepreneurs, we've all heard the plethora of objections and excuses why they can't do business with you. And we have to be very cognizant about the BS meter. It's there. You can't deny it. You got to be careful. So there's a lot of people who, frankly, could not tell you the difference between marketing and sales. They think they're one and the same. They think that marketing and sales and sales and marketing can be interchanged. What are the differences of the two? And what would you say the key differences of marketing versus sales? This is going to be something that most people disagree with. And I have this debate uh, on online and on social almost every day. And um, so just to give you a story, back in the early 2000s, I, I ran an ad in a local paper. I grew up in New York City, Upper East Side, and uh, my practice was there. And I was fresh right out of practice. Uh, I didn't know a soul. I just knew that I needed people to serve. And I wanted to so, you know, looking forward to helping people. And, but, you know, it's crickets. No one coming in. Um, so I had to do something. So I, my first attempt at advertising, I took it and I put an ad into a local newspaper and I put it out there. And I, after a couple of thousand dollars later and a couple of weeks later, guess what happened? Absolutely nothing happened. Like zero, zilch. Nobody came through the door, not even one call. And it absolutely crushed me. And I still remember that feeling because that feeling was so it so much depth and at my core, I just felt like a complete failure. And uh, you know, I even contemplated, is this really what I want to do for a living? It was a very dark time in my life. And so I said to myself, you know what? But that's marketing. So marketing means that I just have to go out there and, and put myself out there. And if I'm doing marketing, then the fact that, that this didn't work it's justifiable, right? So I, I said all of these things to myself, John, just to make me feel better about what a failure I was. But in retrospect, I wasn't marketing. Actually, I was actually selling because when you're selling something, you're expect you're doing something with an expectation of a return. And there's nothing wrong with that. If you advertise, if I've spent $3,000 at that time, which was a lot that I didn't have, that I had to borrow, I didn't do it because I just wanted good PR back then. I didn't even know what PR was. I just wanted to put it out there and I wanted a return. I wanted someone to come in because they saw the ad. That's actually sales. Now, the problem that we're having is that when people make do marketing, they do the same thing that I did. They make excuses on why marketing didn't work. And they constantly get on this merry ground, constantly spending money, trying to get returns and always falling short because they don't, they don't, Treat it as sales. Now, if we treat it as sales, see that the, the difference is enormous because someone who understands sales, number one, their number one objective in sales is how quickly and how efficiently and how accurately 
Can I get into the perspective of my prospects? That is the number one job of any salesperson worldwide. Doesn't matter what product or service. And if you're marketing from that perspective, that means you're doing a very good, per, very good job selling. But when most people do marketing, it's so, it's so generic. It's so, hi, my name is Dan. I'm a chiropractor and I can help you. What, who in their right mind right now would ever apply to an ad like that? But if you do marketing from a sales perspective, it sounds something like this. Hi, you know what? The other day I got up from my chair and I almost doubled over because I couldn't feel my right foot. Completely numb. I felt like in the movie, someone chopped it off from the ankle. But I looked down, I still have my ankle. What is going on? I can't even sit for my, my son's uh, hockey game for more than a period because the pain is excruciating. And right now it's even affecting my bowels. Is this you? Well, this was me back in 2011. I got to tell you something. Blah, 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 blah. That's the copy for an ad because it's in the perspective of the people that you're trying to serve and help. That's sales. Now, what's the difference between marketing and sales, John? Well, I'll tell you. Marketing is just the early, 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 early moment of the sales process. So to me, marketing is a myth. I don't think we should use that word anymore. It just gives so many entrepreneurs excuses on why their sales sucks. We got to start selling in the right way, ethically, without making people feel bad about it, without like, you know, the old school WPRK in Cincinnati, big fat tie, plat jacket. You know, you guys know what I'm talking about. We got to stop that. That's old school. That don't work anymore. But modern sales is all about the efficiency and the eloquence and the elegance of getting into this perspective of your people that you want to serve. To a level where they just say, oh, this guy knows or this lady knows me. And I want to do business with people who know me. And that's all sales. Fire Nation, so many great takeaways from this. Dan, great job differentiating the two and going into some real key details as well as key examples, which is always very helpful for me and I know for you too, Fire Nation. We're going to talk about objections. We're going to get the really deep dive details on the best sales secret, STFU, and so much more when we get back from thanking our sponsors. The new year is here, and my guess is that you have big goals set for you and your sales team over the coming months. From new projects to bringing in more leads, a new year can often feel like a totally new start, but let's not forget the most important part, arming your team with the best tools so they can focus on giving your customers the best experience possible. And this starts with getting ahead of the learning curve so that new challenges turn into new ways to grow. With new features dedicated to helping your sales team improve your customer experience, HubSpot is on a mission to help millions of companies grow better better, starting with yours. Conversion Intelligence Tools helps your teams get real-time insight into calls with automatic recording transcription and call analysis. With more visibility into customer conversions, coaching and customer feedback becomes that much easier. Plus, easy share meeting links let customers see availability and allow them to book meetings with you, all from the HubSpot platform, which cuts out the endless cycle of scheduling emails. Learn more about how you can transform your customer experience with a HubSpot CRM platform at HubSpot.com. Com. Dan, we're all going to face objections in our lives. It's just a part of being a human being. It's a part of going on this journey of life. But tell us the truth. What is the truth about objections? John, the truth about objections is that once you get them, the statistical odds of you overcoming those objections when you receive them are not very good. Most people are objecting to you, let's say, at the end of the sales cycle. So, for example, uh, if you're selling, let's say, a landscape design project and uh, it's worth, you know, $10,000, $20,000, $100,000 project, and you get all the way to the end of your sales cycle and you did a great job and it felt good and it looked like the, the client was tracking with you. Everything was lollipops and unicorns and I just love life. It's going to happen. And all of a sudden, the big hammer hits you right between the eyes and the client or the customer says, you know what, uh, you know, I just feel like it's a little bit too much money or you know what? I think I got to go home and think about it. See, most salespeople believe that that prospect came to the conclusion this was something they didn't want to do right now, or they had to talk about it in that moment. Now, the reality is, is that most people, most people who have objected to your sales process or your product or service have, has already objected to it well before the, the words were uttered. I object. It may have happened on the first phone call, but 
for some reason or another, the prospect, prospect still went through the process with you. And people do some amazingly crazy things. Why would they do that? But they do that. Maybe it was when you're presenting your value stack, as we call it, and uh, the, your suite of services. Maybe it just sounded like it's not wasn't for them because it wasn't in their particular perspective. Or maybe you tipped off the BS meter on, on phase one of this process. They That's when they objected. And then, but unfortunately, people don't stop you. And I'll tell you why. People don't stop people from selling to them because they don't want to confront and they don't want to have to confront the process of uh, confront the salesperson that they don't want it. They're trying to be, you know, kind and they don't want, they want to, they don't want to be rude. So they wait until you're done. They're looking for an opportunity to finally say, you know what? It's not something I really want to do right now. I need to go home and talk to my uh, my Doberman. You know, he tells me what to do. I gotta. <laughs> I'm just a short on cash, and there are the objections. So the understanding the timing of the objections are incredibly important. And and it's funny because I have two great partners, uh, Sean and Jen. And and Jen always says things like um, she always believes, and not only because she's a woman, women sell better because they're innately innately wired to receive. And most of women salespeople, what I found is that they on they feel the the objection before they've uttered it, and usually they'll stop them at that point and address it. And so when we see the objection happening, number one, we have to get trained on recognizing the signs, and we go through all that all of our training for our docs, and it's it's a mind blowing experience because you've seen it before and now you realize oh this is a thing. The second thing is. To have a system of presenting your product and service in a way that it preemptively handles the objection before they even had the opportunity to formulate it in their brains. Now, it's taken a long time for me to actually eloquently explain that in something that we do. But when you actually address the objections before they become a twinkle in your prospect's eye, you have increased the odds of them saying yes to a service or product that you know will help them in the long run. So Fire Nation, I really hope you're understanding that this is the process of life. We're always going to have objections. People are always going to say something, but they might be meaning something else because guess what? Most people are people pleasers. So you have to see that through the proper way. And I've kind of teased this a little bit in the intro and then right before the break, STFU, your best sales secret, Dan. Break it down for us. STFU stands for, I don't know if I should, you know, if I can curse on this, but you can bleep it out, John, but it means shut the f up. Just stop. Stop. Don't speak. Don't talk. You know, uh, my partner, Sean Rundle, uh, he, he's been quoted saying, you know, closing is something, closing and selling is something that we do for our people. It's not something that we do to our people. And STFU is the perfect example because when someone's trying to sell someone or close someone, which is the terms that we usually hear it, it's not true. We close for them and we sell for them. And if you make that distinction in terms of closing and selling being a service as opposed to something you're doing to somebody, what actually happens is innately you stop talking a lot and you're now allowing um, I guess the thorough dynamic forces of the universe to fill the vacuum up with something and you're prospects are the ones that are going to fill that void with what they want, what they need, what they desire uh, at, a, at a level that's very deep. And they connect it to you, the salesperson or the provider of the service or the product as the solution or the, the filler of the void. All too often, because we're not trained properly and we're emotion and our emotional quotient on, on sales is so low that we think that the only way to sell something and convince someone that I'm the best choice or I'm the best price or I'm the best service or I'm the best product, they feel like the only way to do that is to keep talking and verbally vomit all of your features of your service or product over and over and over again. If they don't hear it, you just tend have a tendency to say it louder and, uh, and you just fill all this space with me, 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 I, I, we, we, instead of the lovely word of you. So what we train our docs to do, and this is so part important for healthcare providers, is that they got to shut up. They have to be quiet. They have to ask an open-ended question 
And even if your prospects in our in our uh, situation, if our patients say something that we disagree with, this is the uh, the the moment where you're tested. Can you STFU? Because if you can, your patients will literally give you everything on a silver platter on how to be the the go to person as their solution to their problem. If you're selling a product or service, same thing. Can you STFU long enough for your clients or your customers to say, hey, this is exactly what I want, this is how I want it, and this is how it needs to be. Then you can tailor your offerings in that perspective as opposed to telling them how this is going to go or what they're going to get, not having any idea of what your prospects and your customers and clients and patients actually want. Wow. I mean, Fire Nation, sometimes you just need to break it down to the bare bones. The best sales secret coming at you from Dan, S-T-F-U. Now, Dan, we've talked a lot about a lot today. What is the one core theme? What is the one thing from everything that we broke down today that you really want to make sure Fire Nation gets from our entire conversation? I guess the one takeaway that I wish all the listeners here take away with, and I talk about this with my illustrious partners, Dr. Sean Rundle and Jen Rosenhart, and we talk about this a lot and we brainstorm this, is most, especially chiropractors, we didn't grow up saying we wanted to be chiropractors. You know, we did the same thing. We wanted to be, you know, firemen and, you know, and surgeons and, you know, fighter pilots and so forth. But we stumbled onto this, this incredible profession because ultimately we wanted to help people. And the thing that breaks our heart the most is that there's so many altruistic providers of products and services that all they really want to do ultimately at the end of their time on earth is to serve people to a better way of life, whether it's through a product or service or a healthcare product or service, doesn't really matter. And it breaks our heart when these very well-intentioned people are living check to check, you know, trying to move out of their parents' basement and resenting the fact that they can't get enough people to consume their product and service at enough of a rate to just make meat, ends meet for that particular person when the intentions are so pure. And so the one takeaway here is, is that if anyone is listening and, and you're in that position where you either want your plateaued or you want to increase the, the level of your business or you just feel really unfulfilled that people don't understand what you're providing, I'm going to tell you. It's sales at the core level of it. If you understand sales from a strategic and theoretical level in modern terms, it will absolutely revolutionize not only your business, but your outlook and the type of impact that many of you have the potential to have in your career and everyone that you're serving. So uh, that's, that's one takeaway, John. Give us the best way to connect with you. Any call to action you have for our listeners. Then we'll say goodbye. Sure. Uh, you guys, if you want more of this, and we have a lot of these um, mini tips and, and free um, uh, downloads and PDFs on all the things that I'm talking about and more, and you could find that on www.closeforchiro.com slash fire. Fire Nation, you're the average of the five people you spend the most time with, and you've been hanging out with DB and JLD today. So keep up the heat and head over to eofire.com. Type Dan in the search bar. His show notes page will pop up with everything we've talked about here today. Best show notes in the biz. And Dan, thank you, brother, for sharing your truth, your knowledge, your value with Fire Nation today. For that, we salute you and we'll catch you on the flip side. Thank you, JLD. Thanks for all you do, brother. Appreciate it. Hey, Fire Nation, today's value bomb content was brought to you by Dan and Fire Nation successful entrepreneurs accomplish big goals. That's why I created the Freedom Journal to guide you in accomplishing your number one goal in 100 days. And we're talking step by step. So visit thefreedomjournal.com and I'll catch you there or I'll catch you on the flip side. The My First Million podcast features famous guests, discusses how companies made their first million and brainstorms new business ideas based on the hottest trends and opportunities in the marketplace. One recent ep was all about how venture capitalists make money. Listen to My First Million wherever you get your podcasts.